you know, there were concrete policies that led to that. Concrete policies, concrete practices, some federal, some state, some local, and then a lot of local institutions such as school districts got into the act of broadening uh, policies that essentially remove uh, young people from schools. Um, when I talk about the criminalization of youth, I'm talking about systems, laws, practices that either directly or indirectly result in young people being detained, incarcerated, and even, even if not that, building a record which has an impact on their future. Um, I'm talking about uh, systems that also push kids in a way so that they become disengaged from sort of education and educational opportunity and off track and therefore at high risk for ending up in some system. And I'm also talking about those systems and their impact on the possibility of young people having employment at all or decent employment. And so, but it's a range of systems and, and policies and practices that, that have led to that. And folks, focus so much these days in this area of work on schools is that schools are supposed to be sort of the happy place in the sense of the place that leads to a happy outcome in life that could lead to that opportunity, jobs, things of that sort, education. But they're also a place where some of the, that, that are very closely connected to some of the problems. So the problem of kids being pushed out, the problems of kids um, ending up in, in the justice system. So there has been, I think, a major national effort, primarily in the last 15 years, or I think for many people started back in like 1999, 2000, sort of this movement with the recognition that you know, there's racial impact, there's mistreatment of kids, especially students with disability. A lot of work started in the South uh, around just a cruel treatment of kids. Um, seclusion, in other words, being told to stand in a closet, be removed from your class, you know, sitting in some little remote area of school all day but not learning anything, the use of restraints, handcuffs, other kinds of restraints, uh, and various things that isolated kids. Um, some of the early work on what people call the school to prison pipeline really was work in the South around the mistreatment of primarily kids of color who were uh, classified in the school system as students with disability and efforts to challenge that, those practices in the courts and whatnot. So, big shout out to Eastern State, to the Wildlife Group, uh, doing important work. Uh, developments, just looking at sort of the, the history of these policies, I think that those developments are largely unrelated. Um, that corporal punishment became illegal, unlawful, um, before suspension rates went up, and those are largely separate developments. And then I'll come back over this way. Okay. I think when you look at this scenario, I think you guys talk, you talk about DJS and Department of Ed, but there's not much talk about the Department of Human Services or Social Services, and I think of Baltimore and Philly, they're constantly cutting teachers. Right. nurses and everybody else. Where's the partnership with the service side of the house to sort of provide better services in the school building so all of a sudden a school police officer is not the next best alternative alternative. Right. So did people hear that? No. So uh, okay, we talked about police, but uh, is is, a, is work being done to sort of beef up the Department of Human Services so that they can do better work and more work in schools? Is, is that a rough way? Yeah, there's a partnership of all three organizations. Yeah. Well, so. interestingly enough, with this police diversion program, there is a partnership there. And DHS plays a major role in that. Um, so there is a partnership, a direct partnership there in keeping kids from being arrested uh, in that. Um, and, and as you know, there's a big push now for community schools in, in Philadelphia and schools with so-called comprehensive or wraparound services, looking at schools as places where kids don't just you know, sit at the desk, 
but that there are a variety of sort of human and social services that are offered. So there's a big push for that, but honestly, uh, there's not been a commitment of resource to really developing those kind of schools and those kind of school institutions. And that's part of our struggle here in Philadelphia. Um, I'm going to get you two here, and I'll go over here. Let's try to take one more. Uh, about Dr. Seven, I, I know yeah. I can do this experience. People often have hard for this. So, you want to take one more, and then we'll um, maybe we can ask you later. To okay. Well, can I take a couple more quickly? <laughs> <laughs> oh, go. Uh, so you mentioned that the suspensions and expulsions have been uh, dropping about 50 percent in the last year and a half in Philadelphia. Is that in that rule? No. I said uh, arrest. Arrest at that drop. So our students still, I, last time I was working with you, we were working He was my intern years ago. Um, <laughs> the school reform commission, do they still have to have a hearing after they're expelled, the students? Um, well, in order to a, expel a student or to transfer a kid into a disciplinary program, there is a due process requirement that involves some hearing if it's um, an expulsion. Then it has to go to the, the school reform commission. My question is, is that's there still the law. A lag between that hearing and them. Uh, oh, is there still that lag? Yeah, the lag. Uh, so what? Okay. Let's not let's not talk shop here, man. But let me put it in the common language. One of the problems when when Superintendent Ackerman came in and declared zero tolerance, um, her version of zero tolerance had the district expelling hundreds of kids a year. And the immediate problem we ran into, I think this is what you're referring to, um, the immediate problem we ran into is that there were a large number of kids who were in limbo, who were temporarily assigned to discipline schools while their case was pending. And we had a situation where it took up to six months for the kid to have the expulsion hearing. And meanwhile, the kid's been removed from their school, and they're put in these, what at that time, were crappy programs. Um, that. I think that the system is sped up more so that you don't have as many kids in limbo waiting for a decision to be made about expulsion, if that's the answer question you're asking. Let, let's do it quick. You, um, earlier on in your talk, you had talked about a correlation between disciplinary action in schools and future assistant involvement, but you seemed to imply that it was causally related. I just My question, I guess, is one, can you clarify, and two, if so, could you explain why? Uh, you would assert that there is a causal link between the school disciplinary actions themselves and future discipline and future okay. system involvement. He was pretty loud, and we don't have time to repeat it. So you heard it, all right? Let's pretend like you heard it. So what I've always said is that the link is both direct and indirect. We can show that there is a direct link between the two, and the research shows that the school. I mean, I, you can catch me after where I talk about it, but there's also an indirect link. So when these kinds of discipline, this kind of discipline happens, kids are more likely to end up in a group where they're at greater risk of subsequent involvement. So it's, it's, it's really both. And with direct involvement, some of it involves you know, the use of police, etc. So we can document it both ways. Direct immediate involvement, where a school discipline is tied to some other system and it also leads directly to these criminalization of young people. And then the indirect one where those kids are more likely to drop out of school, become disengaged, and become part of the population that's more likely to get involved. So it's really both. One more, who's the lucky person right here? Um, a question about child fine. Is, is any of this related to child fine? Kids who are undiagnosed or, you know, not getting picked up in the system? Look, yes, but it's so complicated, I don't think we can talk about it. <laughs> but I will talk to you about it. All right, since that was important. Yeah. Different, different, different issues and concerns. I'm finding, I'm so, finding many, so many different mentalities, different mentalities that, that it, seems hard. Hard. it seems hard. It seems challenging. challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard, hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything, everything else, else is a challenge. Is a challenge. challenge. Um, um, so, so, I'm ready. For I'm ready challenge. for this challenge, and I was built, I was for, built this. for this. I think that I think we, that all, have we all have a purpose in life, in life. and mine is going to take on a task that, that most of that most of back away from. Back away from. from. Impossible. That impossible. That people say it's impossible. I see possibilities. I don't see. I don't see anything as being impossible. impossible.
mentality, mentality, mentality there are there are mentalities, different mentalities, but just like just there's like different there's different ways to teach people how to read. There's different, there's different, ways, different ways, ways to communicate people. people. There's different ways. There's different ways to communicate people, people and, and their different mentalities. So I do so I do see hope. I see hope, and that's all coming together and understanding each other and learning to respect.